The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Creation Today. The Book of Mormon claims to be, in its own words, a volume of Holy Scripture comparable to the Bible. Now, both the Bible and the Book of Mormon declare themselves to be ancient, historical, and reliable rules of faith. The very Word of God. Today, we're going to examine these claims to discover the truth. Is the Book of Mormon actually the Word of God? Welcome to the Creation Today Show, where we bring together interviews with experts and solid Bible teaching. Your host, Eric Hovind, affirms the ultimate authority of God's Word, the truth of creation, and why it matters to you. Hey, welcome to the Creation Today Show. If you are new to our show, we are a community of people who enjoy weekly discipleship so that we can turn the stumbling blocks into stepping stones in our lives and in the lives of others on our journey to know Christ even more. Hey, if you're joining us live on Facebook or on YouTube or you're listening to our podcast or watching us by way of television, thank you for peering into the Creation Today community for this conversation. If you ever want to join our community, come on over to creationtoday.org and partner with us to make a difference in eternity. Hey, to my Creation Today show partners out there, to the creation community, I see you guys on here. Thanks so much for being with me. So Amber and Cheryl and Joe and uh, Mariah and William, thank you guys for hanging out with me along with all you other people out there. Uh, I am so glad you guys partner with us to do this. It's 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 truly a blessing to be able to 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 get together and reach more people one person at a time. I love it. Hey, you guys that are on here and those of you joining me on Facebook and uh, television, you're going to love my guest today. He was a fourth generation Mormon who is now the president of Watchman Fellowship. He has over 20 years of ministry experience in the field of Christian counter cult evangelism. He loves apologetics and has been doing that for years. He's incredibly discerning, discerning. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James Walker. James, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, Eric. Great to be back on Creation Today. Looking I, forward to this. No, I love the work that you do. I'm looking forward to this. Are you kidding? This is awesome. Uh, you're, you've, been, you've been doing ministry for years. I met you several years ago. And the way God has gifted you for laying out uh, things in an incredible, nice, neat order to be able to take people from point A to point B or to point Z and hit all the points in between is truly remarkable. I encourage everybody to go sign up at your website, which is, is it watchmanfellowship.org or watchman watchman .org. watchman.org? Watchman.org. Watchman.org. Uh, you guys got to get on his email list. Can you give him a, a little uh, you know, 30 second overview of what got you in ministry and then what your ministry does? Well, you know, I was Mormon, so uh, I'm I'm the president of Watchman Fellowship, but I'm not the founder. And when I was really having doubts about my Mormon faith and beginning to explore Christianity, uh, I was connected with the founder of Watchman Fellowship, uh, David Hinkey, and it was so helpful that he was able to not just uh, know the lingo, but also show me documentation, and it really helped speed up my journey from Mormonism to Christianity. And I started working as a volunteer for the organization and then later joined the staff and became Texas director. Now I'm president. So, you know, Eric's kind of like that old TV commercial, The Hair Club for Men, where I, I'm not only president, I'm also a client. So awesome. I, I needed Watchmen and I try to always remember what it felt like when I had the need. And so as we get the emails and the phone calls and, and the opportunities of ministry, I try to kind of uh, play it forward and, and pay back uh, for those uh, Watchmen people that were there to help me. Well, because of that, uh, you are the one that I recommend. We've got some friends right here in town that uh, have come over to our house, and they are in the Mormon church, and the wife is questioning, and praise God, the husband is saying, hey, you feel free to question, and you know, let's, let's talk about where you're going. I found it a very interesting uh, conversation. I wish, I wish I've had I would have had time to have more conversations, but I'm going, hey, James Walker, he's your guy. Okay, I promise he's been right where you're at. He's studied what you've studied. He's gone through all of it. 
and uh, is coming out the other side going, hey, let me share some truth with you that I think will be helpful. And that's really why I wanted to have you talk about uh, this subject, the Book of Mormon versus uh, the Word of God. And I know I kind of set it up as a as a contrast. And, and I think ultimately that's what we need to do is because this claims to be the Word of God. As we jump in, though, I've got a giveaway and you've got a giveaway that we want to give to a couple of people. I'm going to have you tell about your giveaway at the end or here in, in, uh, before we cut social media off. Let me tell them about my giveaway real quick. Uh, if you if you write a comment in the chat, so for our live viewers here, if you write a comment in the chat, and we're getting close to Thanksgiving, so let's do um, comment. What is your favorite Thanksgiving food? What do you love to have at Thanksgiving time? Just put that in the chat. Uh, if you're one of our uh, our members here, throw that in the chat. If you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, throw that in the chat. What is your favorite Thanksgiving food? You'll be entered into the drawing for our giveaway. We're actually giving giving away uh, the chapter on Mormonism from Volume One of World Religions and Cults, uh, a great book package. We're going to give away that entire chapter on Mormonism for you, and then here in just a few minutes, Doctor Walker has got a giveaway that I think you're going to love as well. So have you do that in just a minute? Okay, Doc. Um, jumping into this. Uh, how, how do we need to start when we're talking about the Book of Mormon versus the Word of God? How do we need to open up this? Like, where, where did the Book of Mormon come from, maybe? Can you, can you, and you got some slides, can you jump in and kind of start educating us on the Book of Mormon and what you've learned about it? Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fair question. You know, is the Book of Mormon comparable to the Bible? And it's certainly a, um, it's certainly a, um, you know, issue that the Mormons themselves raise, and and so I, I think it's a fair you know issue to try to, to discuss and talk about. And the truth of the matter is, Eric, if the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, if it's a volume of Scripture uh, comparable to the Bible, you know, we all we all want to be able to uh, you know join and be part of that. You know, so but again, that that's somewhat begging the question: Is it? And so uh, this is what we would call a a truth versus error approach uh, to um, to the topic. Uh, do we is the Book of Mormon comparable to the Bible? And uh, how would we test that? How would we go about uh, showing that issue? And so when, when I was a Latter-day Saint, this was the thing that was kind of the, the final, one of the final straws for me. I had doubts and questions and other issues came up, but some of the truth claims about Mormonism. Uh, and so we use this, this comparison. Is, is the Book of Mormon the Word of God? Is it comparable to the Bible? Is a way of type of, uh, of witnessing to uh, Mormons uh, with the Book of Mormon, even we call that. So to, to share that contrast with them, we try to do exactly that. And it's part of what we would call an Ephesians 4 approach to sharing the gospel. So a great way of sharing, not just really with Latter-day Saints, but, but with anyone Develop a relationship, and you want to be uh, Ephesians 4. So I've got a passage for you on that Ephesians 4, 14 and 15, that we henceforth uh, be no more children. And, of course, Eric, that's talking about not being spiritually immature. We've all ex you know, probably have experience of, of family or friends that have been Christians for many, many years, but in, in a lot of ways they're still kind of like baby Christians. And so. Right. The, the warning about that, and in, in, in this context especially as we're talking about other religions, the reason we, one of the reasons we don't want to be spiritually mature, it says that we could be carried away or, or carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness by which, uh, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Hmm. So we are vulnerable, spiritually immature, we're vulnerable to deception and being led astray. So the, the solution to that, the antidote to that, is verse 15, that, that we're to be speaking the truth in love, may grow up, and, and, and there's that you know, spiritual maturity, grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, the two kind of elements of that spiritual maturity that you see here in verse 15, uh, and this is applies if we're going to be sharing the gospel with our Latter-day our Latter Saint Mormon friends, it says, but speaking the truth in love. So there's kind of like, you know, two elements here. We want to be, A, speaking the truth, and that has to do with the content. We're mature enough that we know what the truth is. We can articulate. We can, what the things that come out of our mouth are actually true things, which is, you know, very important. But the second one deals with the, not the content so much as the attitude. So we want to be speaking in love. 
And this is a thing that it seems like we as Christians often get way off balance and we can tend to be as Christians, I know I've seen it in my own life, we, we can be kind of like all truth and no love. Yeah. And you may have seen that before. And I, I, I had, I was fortunate, Eric, my Christian friends when I was a Mormon, they, they were great and, and they cared about me and they developed friendship, relationships with me. Um, but I had a couple of friends, man, it was like, they just wanted to kind of win an argument or make me look foolish or kind of bash me a little bit. And, um, you know, lo- looking back, probably um, most uh, probably what they were saying may have been true, but I didn't want to hear them. They wanted to give me a piece of their mind, which I discovered they couldn't really afford <laughs> to give me a piece of their mind. So y- y- we had that issue going on with them. And, uh, and so y- you don't want to be that kind of Christian. But there's also an opposite problem uh, that we can also struggle with, and we want to be—we don't want to be all love and no truth. Yeah. And what that looks like is you—you you, you care about the person, you don't want to damage or, or jeopardize the relationship, and so you kind of never get around to telling them the gospel, telling them the truth. They are lost. They do need a genuine uh, grace relationship with Jesus Christ, and so. We want to avoid those two extremes. We don't want to be all truth and no love, but we also don't want to be all love and and no truth. So that's the kind of content or attitude, not just sharing with the Latter-day Saints, but any type of evangelism, apologetics relationship, I think, need to need to have those in mind. So I'll tell you um, this, the, the next generation does not respect the no truth part. They want the truth. Now, it also needs to be delivered in love, but the Jenner Z had somebody the other day comment on my Facebook page, said, I don't need evidence, I have faith. And I thought, no, that's not what Christian faith is. It's not the lack of evidence. It's because there's so much evidence we can have such great faith. So, oh, man. Yeah, so, so you, you have to have the answers. But the, the other extreme, again, is when you have the answers, sometimes you want to beat people over the head with them. So uh, part of what I struggle with is I, I have to learn, and, and I still, you know, I still struggle with it, but I have to bite my tongue and, you know, pl- uh, be careful of what I'm going to share. I, want, I, could, I, I don't want to refute everything they're saying. I want to bring a question up. I want it to be a conversation and not a lecture and so, uh, you know, all those involved in that Ephesians 4, you know, speaking the truth in love. So uh, I want to challenge, if I could, our, uh, our viewers today. Um, I believe if you do pray and you are equipped, uh, that God is definitely going to give you an opportunity to share the gospel with the Latter-day Saint. Uh, I'm not saying you're going to get a missionary's knock on your door right now as we're talking, but if you if you open yourself up and say, Lord, would you use me? I just really believe that he will. I can really even guarantee it because I have a, a website I want to tell you about uh, that can guarantee that you're going to have an opportunity to share uh, the gospel with a Latter Day Saint, and it's actually the Mormon website itself. This is their main website. It's comeintochrist.org, come into come unto Christ.org. And, and when you go there, this is their main. It's a new website, pretty new website, and it, it's their main outreach. And you'll see there's an icon right there, a little click where you can meet with missionaries, and you can actually click and ask for a free copy of the Book of Mormon. And if you do that. And uh, they'll, you know, want your name and address and everything, and so they can get it to you. But they're very organized, and it only takes a day, a, a day or two, and you're going to receive a new copy of the Book of Mormon. And when you get the Book of Mormon, if you look closely at your new Book of Mormon, you'll see attached to your Book of Mormon are two Mormon missionaries. Yes, they bring it in person, oh. and they <laughs> bring it to your door. And they're going to ask you, do you have any questions? Can we let you take a look? They sometimes underline some passages. Can we come back in a few days to see if you have any questions? Well, you know, after you prepare yourself, you know, and after you're equipped uh, of this particular approach of witnessing to Mormons with the Book of Mormon, you will have some questions. So this is this is how I can say I can guarantee if you really want to be used of the Lord, uh, you will have an opportunity to talk to Latter-day Saints. And let me ask you real quick, just a side note, if you know this off the top of your head, 
right now, how big is the is the Mormon Church? How, how many people are in uh, out of uh, eight billion people on the planet? What size are they right now? I believe the last time I looked, it was 16, 17 million uh, worldwide. Okay. And, and, and for over a couple of decades now, there are more Latter-day Saints outside the United States than inside the United States. Wow. Okay. And um, they have the, the world's largest uh, missionary um, uh, team as well. So usually there are, I think they're around 70,000 full-time missionaries. Wow. Okay. So, anyway, so um, I, I, I would also say that you know what I'm going to share today is you is really like a two hour message that I won't have time to go through and uh, to deal with all of that. So I think we're going to provide a link. Do you want me to talk about that now? Please do. Yes. Okay. So what what I want to do is um, I'm going to provide to you guys a link where you can get the entire two-hour version. I'm actually teaching it at Criswell College in Dallas. And also there's a download where you can download the documentation guide with the, the Mormon source material that you can actually show and share with the Latter-day Saints. Uh, and uh, all that is available, the, the full video plus the, the documentation, the witnessing documents is available. At a, it's a short URL. Uh, uhop.me slash classpass52. So that's uhop dot me slash classpass, C L A S S P A S S 52. And you can immediately get that information and download and be prepared to talk about that. You'll have the video, you know, as well that you'll be able to, um, to deal with and, uh, to be able to, um, kind of train up on that. So uh, I won't be able to cover everything today, but I want to whet your appetite and give you a taste of what what you're going to be able to share and talk to a Latter-day Saint. Uh, actually, even using the Book of Mormon is a great starting place to have, have a question and dialogue with, uh, with your Latter-day Saint friends or the Mormon missionaries that have brought you your, your free Book of Mormon. I'm excited to learn because I wish I would have had this stuff on the top of my head about eight months ago when we had this family over for dinner. Now, granted, I was trying to do what you said and just love and not really make it a contest, but it's almost like she was bringing on, like, come on, tell me, what what's the evidence? What do we got? So uh, I wish I would have right. had some more of this stuff on top of my head. Right, and, and it is a definite time of questioning for Latter-day Saints. Like never before, there are, there are Latter-day Saints uh, that are having doubts, having questions. The Internet, the Mormon leaders have even acknowledged the Internet is killing them. And what used to be secret or difficult to find is now can, can be a click away. And I hope what I'm sharing with you guys today is an example of how we can, we can leverage technology to be able to, to just give you all the tools that you need. So, again, we want to be examining the, the Book of Mormon in, in light of the Bible. So is the Book of Mormon a... Um, a um, volume of scripture comparable to the Bible. And, and Eric, what I, what I kind of feel like I need to do is I want to start with the most famous passage in the Book of Mormon because you've got to be ready for this at some point, usually very early in the conversation. You're, the Mormon missionary or your Mormon neighbor, are, they're going to take you to this verse and they're going to challenge you with it. So I want to get you ready for this. And um, Eric, what, what, would you, what was your idea? What do you think is the, the most famous verse in the Bible? Well, it's going to have to be, well, I know it was John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, it's turning into uh, judge not, even though nobody knows where that's at in the Bible. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought you might want to go Genesis 1 1, just oh. being. <laughs> yeah, I guess I should have, yeah. Genesis 1 1. Most people do go. say, most people do say John three sixteen, but we you do get this. Uh, softball, and I swing and a miss. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna miss. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I, but whichever that verse is, definitely in the Book of Mormon, there's no question, and it's Moroni chapter ten, verse four. And the reason it's it's something we've got to be able to deal with. It deals with an area that's called epistemology, which basically just means how do we know what's really true? How do we know truth? And the Book of Mormon's going to make a strong case here. And it's the underlying philosophy of almost every Mormon you talk to that the only true and best way to know truth is you must pray about it and ask Heavenly Father. And that comes from this Moroni 10.4 passage. So let, let me just share it with you. 
this is in your download manual. I gave you that link to page one. Right away, you have the full scan of that of that uh, passage from the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Moroni, in the Book of Mormon, chapter 10, verse 4, it says, And when ye shall receive these things. Now, Eric, it's talking about when you get your Book of Mormon, when you receive it. It says, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. So, so the idea is you pray and you ask Heavenly Father if it's not true. And it says, And if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. So the promise, or, or in this case, is really like a challenge. If you pray about the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon promises you that you're going to get this, this some type of spiritual testimony that's going to communicate with you, and the Holy Spirit is going to tell you that Joseph Smith, the the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, was a true prophet, that the Book of Mormon is the very Word of God, and you're going to have this reassurance, this confidence. And so early on in your conversation with a Mormon neighbor or the Mormon missionary, they're going to ask you the question, did you pray the prayer? And you're saying, like, which prayer? Well, you know, the Moroni 10.4, did you get down on your knees sincerely and ask Heavenly Father? And the thing that makes this made this so difficult for me is, you know, Eric, I prayed the prayer. As a Mormon, I mean, we all do. And I, to this day, believe I probably did get a spiritual testimony, a spiritual testimony telling me that the Book of Mormon was true. Now, what happened to me is on further review, I became convinced that it wasn't the Holy Spirit giving me that testimony, but a different type of spirit. Maybe a deceiving spirit was telling me these things. But I've even wrestled with this. What happened to me when I prayed that prayer? And so what we what we want to remember is prayer uh, we we're in favor of prayer and you know we we certainly uh, believe in the power of prayer but prayer is not a um, a foolproof way of finding uh, information true false multiple choice you know you, we don't tell our children when it's time for the big exam pray about it no we tell them study it you better study it don't just pray and go take your best guess you have to study it and in my notes uh, on, on my witnessing material I share with the Mormons, I always try to I put the word Islam in the notes mm-hmm. just as a reminder to me that all the religions, either uh, virtually all religions, either pray or meditate. And the Muslims, they pray. And, you know, I have Muslim friends. They pray five times a day. They have a testimony about a prophet, uh, Muhammad, in a book, the Quran. But with all their sincerity, uh, that doesn't make Islam true. And so praying is not the way the Bible tells us that we're to know truth versus error. Instead, the Bible tells us that the way we know these things is by testing. The Greek word is dokimatso. And the idea is that we test to know those things are true. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible tells us, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to, which means like listening to, uh, it says, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And so we learn from the Word of God that when we pray, it's at least theoretically possible that spirits other than the Holy Spirit could be answering our prayers. And this is why the Bible says we must test the spirits. And the way that the the Bible puts forth of testing these things is comparing what the Word of God, the Bible says, with what other spirits are saying. And so if the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible, which is what we believe, then everything the Spirit says must line up with the Bible, with the Word of God. If it doesn't, there's a possibility it's not the Holy Spirit, but this other kind of spirit. So... Again, this is, this is why we want to test these things and not simply go uh, on the spiritual testimony. Th- does because that make sense? It does. So a Mormon, this is the number one evidence to them is, no, 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 the Spirit bore witness with me. I prayed and it bore witness with me that these things are true. That's kind yeah, of... A- 
and to make it practical in a conversation, and I had this conversation with my Christian friends, some of them would say, well, you didn't really feel the Spirit. Well, I know what I felt was real. I, I was pretty sure it was real. Yeah. And uh, they, they, Or they would say, some Mormons describe the spiritual testimony, they call it a burning in their bosom. You know, I had some of my other friends say, well, James, that was just uh, heartburn or something like that. So, <laughs> in other words, they were belittling it. And so that doesn't didn't help me at all right? because I knew I was convinced that what I felt was real. But I had one Christian friend ask it this way, Eric. James, how, how do you—it could be—he said this. He said, it could be real and still not be true. I said, what? What do you mean real and not true? It could be a real spirit, but how do you know it's the Holy Spirit? Have you ever tested it, the spirit? And I thought, I had never even thought about that before. And he showed me this passage in 1 Timothy that, uh, that uh, about these other spirits out there. And that was so helpful to me. And this is at every point in the conversation, you're going to be dealing with these two ways of testing, two ways of knowing truth. Do we know truth simply by praying about it? Or do we have to learn how to test that spirit according to the Word of God to see if it really comes from God? Okay. So um, let me kind of give you the background, if I could, if we're going to be talking to Mormons about the, about the uh, Book of Mormon, uh, just a little quick crash course on what the Book of Mormon is and how we got it. The Book of Mormon is a scripture uh, divided into chapters and verses, you know, uh, in books of, books of the Book of Mormon, separate books, chapters and verses, just like the Bible. And it tells the st- story of an, an angel named Moroni, who uh, in 1823 uh, appeared in the Mormon prophet founder Joseph Smith's bedroom. And he claimed to be an angel and told Joseph Smith uh, about some scriptures. Now, to back up a little bit, Moroni was supposedly actually not an angelic being as we think of that, but it was actually a prophet who had once lived here in, in, in the Americas, in the New World. And the story goes there were Jewish people living in Jerusalem about 600 B.C. This is the main story of the whole Book of Mormon. And these Jewish people um, were warned. It was Lehi, a Jewish man and his children. and, and um, they, he, he was warned that, God, that, that, that Jerusalem was about to be destroyed, the Babylonian captivity. And he was to flee Jerusalem about 600 B.C. So they build this big boat and they, the, the, the sons and daughter, daughter-in-laws and the whole family, extended family, get in this big boat and a great wind blows them, and they sail and sail and sail, and they finally wind up on what the Book of Mormon calls a narrow neck of land, which Mormons believe were some, was somewhere in Central America. They, they, they land in the New World, and they find, the new, they find this new land to be not inhabited. It's, it's, it's void of people. And so the Book of Mormon tells the story how this Jewish family uh, over the centuries, multiplied and became two great nations. Uh, the, the, the Nephites that were named after one of the sons of Lehi, Nephi, and then the other son, um, Mar- uh, the, the other son, uh, Laman, uh, his descendants were known as the Lamanites. And the Book of Mormon tells the story about warfare between these two Jewish people groups living here in America. Uh, and for the most part, the Lamanites were the bad guys and the Nephites were the good guys. But it, this is like goes on for, for 800 years. And so the Book of Mormon story goes from 600 B.C., the main story of the Book of Mormon, 600 B.C. to 421 A.D. And there's a battle described uh, near a hill called the Hill Cumorah in which the Lamanites finally killed all the Nephites except one. There was only one living Nephite, and it was this, this military leader named Moroni, who was a, a, a prophet of, of the people as well. And Moroni is the last living Nephite. And so Moroni eventually dies, and then supposedly in 1823, this same Jewish prophet living in America 
appears in Joseph Smith's bedroom. Now, there's all kinds of problems with the story. This is not an angelic vision. This is a dead man, which is an occult practice called necromancy. The Bible always warns against communication with the dead. And Joseph Smith in his bedroom is allegedly talking with, it's like a seance, talking with this dead Native American Israeli prophet. Have I lost you already? I'm aware yeah. <laughs> I've lost yeah, you on like, this one. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty intense. Okay, so so basically, the Book of Mormon. Uh, Joseph Smith is told by Moroni that uh, that he he was this that shortly before his death in 421 A.D. he had buried in the the hill Cumorah the sacred gold plates or gold tablets contained an engraved record of a scripture for these Jewish people living in America, and the Lamanites become the principal ancestors of the American Indians. So this is where the Indians come from. They actually came originally from Jerusalem, and they're, they're, Israel, they're Israelites. They're Jewish. So you have these Jewish Indians, and I, I know this is getting a little bit complicated, but do you follow along so far? Well, I, 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 my mind is already going, hang on, I just did a webinar, a conversation, a Christian Today show a couple of weeks ago on the Hebrew, uh, the black Hebrew Israelite movement where it's the, the anybody who is black is supposedly the real Jews. And now it's, oh, no, the Indians are actually Jewish. And okay, wow. Yes, and there's all kinds of problems with the story, but it it addresses one of the big questions of the 19th century. Where did the Native Americans come from? They came from Jerusalem. And so basically what happens is Joseph Smith is able to eventually, it's a long story, but he eventually gets access to the gold plates and he's able to, to, to dig them up. And he finds them inscribed in a language he called Reformed Egyptian Hieroglyphics. And Joseph Smith is able, um, over the next several years, to translate uh, this book um, into what later becomes the Book of Mormon. So uh, the gold plates, Joseph Smith translates into the 1830 first edition Book of Mormon. And the key, Eric, is that this Book of Mormon I was taught uh, in the Mormon scriptures was translated, quote, by the gift and power of God, end quote. Now, the, the reason it is, is I, I, this is why I thought I could really have confidence in the Book of Mormon. As I was taught as a Latter-day Saint, there's actually five sources of scripture. You have the Bible. They always want to use the King James Bible. The Book of Mormon we're talking about right now. There's another one called the uh, Pearl of Great Price. Much of that purportedly also translated from Egyptian documents. And, and the, um, uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, which is mostly a collection of revelations or prophecies received by the prophet Joseph Smith. And fifthly, the prophet could, could, could theoretically bring forth new scripture even today. So the canon is not closed. We could still potentially have new scripture as well. But of these five different scriptures, I was clearly taught only one of them has mistakes in it. Can you guess which one? <laughs> I'm just going to go with the Bible. And throw it exactly. Out. So, oh, a softball so, that I hit. Yes. Yes. So, so I'm thinking uh, they never give you a list of where these alleged mistranslations are in the in the book in the Bible. But uh, I was clearly taught that the Bible's not been translated correctly, and so anything that seemed to disagree with Joseph Smith of the Book of Mormon, I'm guessing or wondering could that be one of the mistakes in the Bible? So, but the Book of Mormon is translated by the gift and power of God. So this is why, to me, it was much more trustworthy than the Bible. You know, when I took uh, Greek and Hebrew and learned to translate Greek and uh, Hebrew, I did not translate by the gift and power of God, if you know what I mean. I uh, I would forget vocabulary words and get it wrong sometimes. But uh, Joseph Smith doesn't suffer from that, so this is why you know, that you're going to find this to be superior. In fact, here's how Joseph Smith said it. He said this, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. Mm -hmm. A man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. So this is the book. This is why you have the confidence in it. And, And again, this helps in our whole claim because if they're right, if this is more correct than the Bible in any other book, we all ought to be Latter-day Saints. 
But this is a testable claim. This is something that it's demonstrable. We can, we can address these issues. We can lay the Book of Mormon and the Bible side by side and, and begin to address these issues and, 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 and basically just ask that question. Is it the most correct of any book? So there's a couple of categories on the, 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 the longer version of this teaching I go into more depth on, but it, there's a couple of areas that I think we ought to at least know about. Eric? Let, me, let me do this. I got to let social media go right now and our television audience go. Um, can you, because I really want them, I want to I wanna say who the winner is of the drawing for the people who put in their names or put in their favorite Thanksgiving food. But um, can, can you give me real quick, is there any such thing as reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics that he says he translated this from? Like, would 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 scholars today? Is there any such thing as that language that he says he got it from? We've never found any extant copies, and we court we don't have the original gold plate, so we don't have that either. It's a it's a language that we have no knowledge ever existed, and Joseph Smith was the only one who could. Could purportedly translate it anyway. So this is all we have. There's behind this. There's nothing other than Joseph Smith's words saying, "This is what I got, and I translated this from Reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics." And there's no evidence around the world of Reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics. There's no there's no evidence that the Book of Mormon existed at all before the 19th century. Wow. Uh, okay. We want to. I want to get into some of these points. I know in your notes, and please, we, we should have put it in the chat, uh, but your link there. Uh, you can get the same link. I mean, we're going to do a giveaway. Ladies, let me see who you're giving, giving away stuff to. Um, ladies, you are feeling generous today. Oh, my goodness. Hey, guys, here's what they're doing. Ladies, thank you. They're over in the office over there. Um, hey, uh, the chapter on Mormonism, along with Dr. Walker's uh, I said Dr. Walker again. James Walker, he's smart enough to be a doctor. I always think of him as Dr. Walker. Uh, along with his video and his book training, uh, the link to that can all be found at creationtoday.org slash Mormon. Creationtoday.org slash Mormon. You go there and you, so you guys are going to give that to everybody. You guys, that's impressive. So they're giving that away to absolutely everybody. All you got to do is go to creationtoday.org slash Mormon. Hey, before I let you go, though, one more thing. Mr. Walker, you've got a podcast that is, I wish I had a podcast that was good as you. You guys do an incredible job on your podcast, and you just interviewed somebody from the Church of Scientology. I don't want to give that one away, but that's going to be a hot one. So where do they go to get your uh, your podcast? What do they just look up Watchman Fellowship on their, on yeah, their app? Uh, Watchman.org. And right there on the homepage, you can either watch the video version or listen to the, the audio podcast. And I interview, um, I talked for the very first time in public about the nine and a half million dollar lawsuit that the Church of Scientology filed against us. And we have as our guest, the guy behind all that, who's now out of the Church of Scientology, uh, Michael Render. And it's a fascinating uh, two-part interview. So go to watchman.org. You're going to want to watch that one, okay? Hey, social media, I hate to cut you guys off. If you want to be part of the full conversation, come on over to creationtoday.org and partner with us. We'd love to have you join us in reaching the world. Uh, partners, we're going to keep on going here. I find this fascinating. And Dr. Walker, James Walker, I want to get into, uh, you got you got several areas to go through archaeology, DNA evidence, uh, you know, what, what is the actual claims of the Bible? What are the claims of the Book of Mormon, the locations, the geographies? So I want to start getting into several of these in our, in our last half hour here. Uh, for those of you that uh, join me on social media, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Next week, we are going to have a great conversation. I'm talking to creationists, Far side. Dan Letha is an incredible cartoonist for the glory of God and really focuses on apologetics and creation. His cartoons are superb, and he's going to be my guest next Wednesday at noon uh, Central Time uh, on uh, yeah next Wednesday. So please join me or come on over to creationtoday.org and be part of what we're doing. Okay, Dr. Walker, the Book of Mormon tells us the story of uh, Nephi and Le uh, what was the other one? Lee? Lee, uh, hang on. The two, the two, the people that fought. Layman, the, layman, layman. Thank you. And um, and we're up to the part where there's a big war, uh, and now the gold plates have been given by uh, what was his name again? Moroni, Angel Moroni to Joseph Smith. Joseph translates them, 
And we have the Book of Mormon now. Is that about where we're at?